less than a square kilometer of land blown apart by more than 500 mine explosions in four horrific years of endless combat. This is Vauquois, one of the worst killing fields of the First World War. A conflict that began on a hilltop and took 15,000 men's lives as the war took a tactical turn toward the darkest depths of the earth. There is nothing left of the French village of Vauquois. In its place, there is just this desolate lunar landscape. It is often forgotten that here, most of the Great War was fought underground. For four years, the German and French miners dug a labyrinth of tunnels and chambers with the sole aim of blowing each other to pieces. Its strategic location spelt its destruction. Andy Hawkins and Julia Richardson of the British Archaeological Association, the Durand Group, have come to meet one of Germany's foremost experts on the battle, Adolf Buchner. Buchner and his son visit regularly to explore existing tunnels from the era. You can hardly believe this village was here on this spot. Now you can only see the craters. Um, what you can also observe is that there are no trees around here. This explains that uh, once uh, the German or the French were here standing around having a few in all directions. Thousands of French and German soldiers died as each side tried to control the hill. In the horrific stalemate, tunnelers on both sides blew a total of no less than 539 mines underneath the spot where a quiet village once stood. It's been estimated that in the first six months of battle 8,000 French and 6,300 Germans died. So you see on a small area 100 meters wide it's enormous, unthinkable in our day and age. First real mine warfare explosion was done in, uh, on 13th of May uh, um, 1915. Right. There were two German explosions and one French one. Okay. And from that, uh, the mine warfare started really. Mm -hmm. Until the last explosion was a, a German one. It was on the 9th of uh, April 1918. Adolf Buchner has privately published the diary of one of the protagonists of this battle, Hermann Hoppe, a German pioneer specialized in siege warfare, tunneling and explosives. It is interesting because it gives us a glimpse of the life of the sapper and it shows the differences between the lives of a sapper and a sapper engineer and an infantryman. In August 1914, Germany invaded France in a wide, enveloping movement through neutral Belgium. In September, the German 5th Army occupied the village of Vauquois briefly and then retreated, but returned two weeks later to dig in for good. The hill was a key position from which two important valleys and a vital railway line could be controlled. We find out that Hermann Hoppe had a brother-in-law, Willy Fischer. The brother-in-law drew a postcard of his own of Vauquois in 1915. Willy Fischer was in the 98th, and he was there on the 15th of September 1914. Then they withdrew from Vauquois, and he was with the last troops to leave Vauquois and the village was practically intact. Unable to win a swift victory, the German army dug an impregnable line of trenches from the Alps to the North Sea, 
on the higher ground where possible. The German Imperial Engineer units were to play a key role in the evolution of trench warfare. Adolf Buchner met with Dieter Storz, the great war expert of the military museum at Ingolstadt in Bavaria, to have his views of how tunnel warfare evolved. According to military theory, until 1914, there was a clear distinction between field warfare and siege warfare. All the European states had reinforced their frontiers with more or less heavy fortifications. Certainly, they were very different forms of combat. When the front stabilized, they introduced this specialized form of siege warfare, which all of a sudden became a normal form of combat. Many weapons and many combat methods that were typical of siege warfare became daily routine in trench warfare. Mine warfare was amongst these. Balloon warfare should also be mentioned. In the decades before the war, the German Imperial Army embraced modern military technology like no other army in Europe. The machine gun used the recoil of each shot to load another round making it a super rapid-fire killing weapon. Hydraulics, rifling and new high explosives made modern artillery faster firing and more lethal than ever before. Germany had the advantage of a very strong heavy artillery that they had developed before the war. A heavy mobile field artillery that the French did not have in such quantity. The British had artillery that was structured similarly to the German, but in smaller quantities. German engineers like Hermann Hoppe adapted the cellars of the original houses that once stood in the village into bunkers, redoubts, and machine gun posts. Cement and steel were brought up from the rear to make them solid and resistant to French attacks. They built trenches on the southern flank of the hill. The firepower at the defender's disposal was simply unbeatable. The first company of the 30th Pioneer Battalion arrived in Vauquois because the French were preparing tunnels. So the company turned up in Vauquois on the 7th of January, 1915. The French were determined to recapture the hill with its view of a strategic road and rail routes between Paris and Verdun. In December 1914, whole French infantry regiments made massed frontal charges against it. A month later, the French had regained a precarious hold of the bottom of the hill. In February 1915, the attacks by the French redoubled. Decimated by shrapnel from German artillery, the infantry conquered the German second line trench, just 20 meters further up. The grandfather of the Le Couturier brothers died in the great attack of February 1915. Our mother was born in 1910 and her father was killed on the 17th of February 1915 at Vauquois. On the single day of the 17th of February 1915, more than a thousand soldiers died on the hill of Vauquois. The French had prepared six tunnels and wanted to blow up these six tunnels at the beginning of the attack. So the sappers had to dig counter tunnels and on the 7th of January the first countermine blew that caused little damage. In any case, the attack of the 17th of February 1915 arrived and of these six mines only two blew. They didn't do much damage but enough to allow combat to reach the village. By March 1915, the French were consolidating a position in the village. 8,000 French soldiers had been killed. 6,000 Germans had died in the counter-attacks. During the March 1915 battle that raged on the summit of the hill, the Germans employed a new, terrifying weapon, the flamethrower. The 
The interesting thing about the flamethrower is that it had to be handled by firemen who were used to managing fires. The flamethrower was a close combat weapon and had a very strong psychological effect because fear of burning is obviously one of man's greatest fears. The ability to resist a flamethrower attack involves a good dose of courage and discipline in the troops under attack. Anyway, the enemy had been pushed back. Then the next attack came, on the 28th of February. And this was without mines or mine preparation, but the sappers were on the spot and had to take care of finding shelter for the troops. There were a lot of people in Vokwa, two battalions, and they had to try to stay on the hill. The French had intensified their attacks and then prepared even heavier artillery, firing shells up to 27 centimeters, very big shells. And when they exploded, they made craters eight meters in diameter and five meters deep, so obviously they tried to dig even deeper. The village was reduced to rubble. The gardens and woodland that surrounded it were now just one of the thousands of killing fields of the Western Front, but with a difference. The strategic hill of Vauquois was a perfect observation point for French and German artillery in the battles that raged around the fortress city of Verdun during the First World War. French infantry conquered half of the hill in March 1915, with an enormous loss of life. But a deadly standoff in the high street of the village triggered a whole new phase of the battle. The greatest losses at Vauquois were suffered during the assaults up to March 1915. During these assaults, up to a thousand soldiers were put out of action, killed or wounded. The mine war that followed for the next three years didn't cause many victims. Many, by our standards, and we're talking about 800 dead in those three years, both French and German. So you see, compared with the day of French or German attacks in 1915, it's significantly less. What is certain is that, for example, the first company of the P-30 battalion lost 69 men, together with the infantry, in the period between the 7th of January 1915 and the date they had to leave for the other front, that's to say, the 9th of April 1918. In that period, they lost 69 men, of which 57 died, and of which 9 died from gas poisoning. Nowhere else along the thousand-kilometer western front did the war literally go underground. Over the four years of the war, the French and Germans exploded hundreds of mines in a bitter attempt to prevent each other from dominating the hill. And so, on the 13th of May 1915, the first mines exploded. Two German and one French. And before the end of May, a total of nine German and six French mines had exploded, so in a very short space of time. And so they went on. I think the peak came in July, no, in August, with a total of 27 German explosions and 18 French ones. Can you imagine more than 27 explosions in one month? Discover the past with exclusive military history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all on History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to watch everything, from the gripping story of the Band of Brothers to Operation Barbarossa and D-Day. Immerse yourself in the dramatic stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. After the French infantry had recaptured half the village of Vauquois, an uneasy balance of firepower settled in. The church and its chestnut tree became symbols of the destruction and the descent into the hell of tunnel warfare. In May 1915, three French mines were exploded on the west of the village and the infantry attacked to occupy the northern edge. It was yet another bloodbath. 
The Germans exploded three on the eastern part of the hill. As infantry attacks became too costly in lives to continue, the tunnelers dug deeper and drove their galleries towards enemy tunnels to destroy them before the mines could be set off. These anti-tunnel mines were called camouflet. Obviously, it was very frightening to work in tunnels. Men feared for their lives, not knowing what the enemy was doing close by, whether he was going to blow a mine or not blow one. Adolf has taken Andy and Julia underground to explore the tunnels. Here, attack tunnels were driven towards enemy lines, close to living quarters and logistics facilities. In the Spanstollen, Paul Rada, this was a pioneer of the one, one, uh, one first company, uh, he lost his life due to gas in the Spanstollen. And Paul Rada was a, a very good comrade to Hermann Hoppe, and Hermann Hoppe has his picture. On the 21st of February 1916, three German armies attacked the French towards the city of Verdun in an attempt to bleed France dry of soldiers. It was the strategy of annihilation employed by the new German Chief of General Staff, Eric von Falkenhayn. He believed that he could lure the French into murderous counter-attacks so they could be decimated by artillery and machine guns. The massive attack on Verdun pushed local commanders on the hill of Vauquois to do more to capture the strategic high ground. The French engineers inched their way forward over the months and on the 23rd of March 1916 placed a 12-ton mine under the German positions where the church had been. It killed 50 German troops, but the infantry attack that ensued was still repulsed by the well-entrenched Germans who fell back to the second line. In 1916, the underground war took a completely new turn. The comrades of Hermann Hoppe decided to blow a massive crater on the western side of the hill in revenge for the mine of March. They used their favorite ammonium nitrate explosive known as Westphalite. The result was a crater that ripped the heart out of the hill and took the underground war to new extremes. They began a series of explosions trying to better the enemy, and so the biggest explosion on the hill of Vauquois was the one on the 14th of May 1916, which was 60 tonnes, 60,000 kilos of Westphalite, which exploded and blew up the whole of the west side of the hill. The French were surprised by this explosion. You can understand that after this explosion, the morale of the French was very low, and they never used more explosive than that. That day, the French were outdone. Andy and Julia are looking for the tunnel that led to the massive May 1916 mine that marked a turning point in the underground battle and killed 109 French infantrymen. They follow Adolf through the maze of tunnels built by Hermann Hoppe and his men. 90 meters underground, they are stopped in their tracks by the rising water table. Okay. So we're in this entrance tunnel now, so we're coming down and we've been stopped by this sump because it's too big to, to go across. Yeah. Okay. And it's filled with water this time of year, of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us then where we were going and, and, and the story behind the attack? The particular tunnel was going. Okay, we are now in the west position of of Vauquois, and uh, on 23rd of March 1916, the French met a an explosion in the center uh, of Vauquois, uh, which uh, was a surprise uh, for the Germans. The, the listening service did not hear oh, the okay. advance, so they planned a revenge, and the revenge was uh, this one. It was a gallery 1B. And uh, this gallery was uh, dug in a form of a sea, of a, uh, okay. of a saw, like ah, that, right. okay. uh, to uh, to better uh, to have a better uh, temp, uh, temping. Uh -huh. 
and uh, this uh, was intended to uh, to, to, blown up, to get blown up with a charge of uh, 60 tons wow. of uh, Westphalite uh -huh. of explosive that is a very high quantity yeah. and uh, because it was uh, uh, the, the gallery was uh, uh, dug on the far west end of Foucault. Uh -huh. uh, also there the, the, the French service did not realize that the Germans were coming underground. So there was no countermine. Uh -huh. And even on the 14th of May 1916, when uh, the German um, um, performed explosion, uh, also that was a surprise of, uh, for the French and uh, the position was fully uh, um, uh, occupied by, okay. the, by the infantry people, by the guards and so on. So the, the loss was about 109 men. The massive crater, shown here in pictures of the time, blew the French lines apart, allowing a temporary German gain. The German tunnels were fully equipped to host hundreds of men to defend what was left of the village. They were equipped with sleeping quarters and kitchens. There are beds, you know beds? Yeah, <laughs> beds, not beds. beds. Yes, a very, very simple construction, a wooden one. Uh, we have also seen constructions with this uh, iron, the uh -huh. Schumann Eisen. Uh, oh, with, the, with the holes, interlocking holes. With the interlocking okay. holes, yeah. and you can very easily construct such a bed. It's not stable like that. <laughs> and imagine that would shake a fair bit. Yes, yeah. uh, yes. Uh, um, yeah, once you are started uh, shaked by, by, by wave, by, by shock wave from the explosion, then I mean... It was exaggerated. A garrison of 1,000 German soldiers lived here, mostly underground, in a well-designed and protected area. Hygiene was basic. Lice, fleas and rats infested their bedding and food. Nearby were the kitchens, where the soldiers would come to eat in one of the day's fleeting human moments. Adolf personally excavated what seems to be a kitchen facility close to the attack tunnel. The people passed here to, to receive uh, their, their, their plates. Yes? Just put the steam as it's cooking, out the back. Yeah. Oh, don't tell me that. I'm, um, I, I don't know what that spoil was. <laughs> <laughs> but presumably you'd have something covering on the top. This the interesting thing is I found a photograph of it. This, this room oh, right. with okay. this, with this inside, and we have reconstructed that okay. again uh, in line with this photograph. And it's a very good photograph. You see two uh, two kitchen uh, people, uh -huh. personnel, the chefs. Uh, yes, <laughs> but they had a, a plate where uh, you had the inscription "Von wegen Aushungern," and uh, "Von wegen Aushungern." Uh, uh, we are not hungry. Oh, okay. And this was to show that the blockage, the British blockage, is was not very blockage. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. A couple of bits of graffiti. Yeah. Why do you have graffiti? It suggests that it's an area where people aren't just passing through, so it's not just a passing mm -hmm. section. This badge, actually, uh, it's a uh, shield. Yeah. Uh, 1917, dated. And you recognise the badge there? Yes, uh, I think the colours could be the blue, the white, blue could be the Bavarian one. On the other side of the hill, the French planned their revenge. Starting from their rear line, they brought in a light railway to bring out debris and dug even deeper on the German trenches. The Germans and French raced to go deeper to attack each other's tunnels and blow each other's trenches. So this picture is a mine explosion. It's a German picture, a German explosion. I don't know when it was taken, on which day, but it comes from Vauquois, and it shows that a mine explosion was like a volcano, and it would have been placed under a trench with men inside it. There couldn't have been any survivors. This map of the trench lines of the French and German sides of the hill indicates how much better the German redoubts were supplied and defended. 
Adolf takes Andy and Julia to look for the generator room, the supply of the basic comfort of the tunneler, light. We are now in the front of the Kaiser Stollen, or the Kaiser Gallery. It was one of the main galleries uh, what, who was in, in, in use in, in operation in uh, 1916. Made a lot of um, explosions, not only from the, this is the main main uh, truck, but uh, it is uh, uh, diverted uh, several times. Okay. So this is uh, the generator room. Uh, it's one of them. There were two. The other one is now destroyed. Uh, it was an accident uh, on 15th of uh, June, uh, 15th of August, 1917. One of, of the machine of the the, the motor explodes. Uh, was it a well, big explosion and. Yeah, everything is destroyed at the other side. Mm. But they put uh, two generators, one was running uh, for uh, 12 hours while the other one was maintained and vice versa. You can see the foundation of the generator again uh, still and uh, here it was the flying wheel. How, how did they ventilate? Uh, we are not far away from the, from the outside, from the slope, about right. 10 or 50 meters. Right. And they, uh, you can see there are t um, uh, it's a duct here and yeah. If you are going a little bit in this chamber, which uh, looks not very nice, it's okay. uh, g full of rubble, full? but yeah. you can creep uh, and you can see how it continues. The map of the tunnels shows just how close combat and logistics areas were. When the time came to attack, no point of access was out of bounds. Some of these attack tunnels intersected French ones on the other side of the hill. I think it's the Richthofen, Richthofen Gallery. Okay. Uh, if, I, if, I the map, if I can interpret the map I have in my mind. Yeah. So it must be, must be Richthofen. But again, this is another one that's sort of uh, full of water, isn't it? Yes. So are we actually below the water table? We here? are below the water table. Right. And uh, there's another gallery, fighting gallery uh, left uh, behind me. Yeah. It's also full of water. Right. And uh, in summertime, the water level will sunk, and but it, it will always be uh, remaining water inside. So, yeah. if you want to visit it, you have to pump. Okay. By the end of 1916, the French and German lines ran roughly through the centre of what had been the village, just a few meters apart. As the main effort of the war moved elsewhere. The garrisons fighting for Vauquois became depleted. Just a battalion of a thousand men on each side held the line. Life in the dugouts and trenches was horrific on both sides, but especially for the under-equipped French. The small museum that stands at the foot of the Vauquois hill tells the story of the men who fought each other here to the death. Over the years, armies developed light machine guns that could be served by a single man, making life more hellish than ever. They were very precise weapons, but they were very heavy for certain tactical needs, so light machine guns were introduced. The French and the English went ahead, as you see here with the French model Chauchat and the British Lewis machine gun. The Germans had to keep up and created their own model. Since they didn't have light machine guns in stock, they used their old machine gun, the MG-08, but adapted it to have a lighter structure. Small mortars were developed to lob shells into the opposing trenches during an attack. They kept the defenders' heads down for a few vital seconds as the infantry made slow progress through the barbed wire entanglements. Opposing trenches were so close that artillery support was impractical. A few kilos of explosive and shrapnel could kill five or six men. Each time one was fired, the other side would retaliate. The hand grenade was a weapon developed for sappers during siege warfare. Who used hand grenades before 1914? Sappers and anarchists. Then they were used in the First World War, when trench warfare developed, and they became one of the most common infantry weapons. The hand grenade became a preferred weapon for attackers when rifle fire failed to kill the enemy. At first, the French used these primitive hair cone grenades that were little more than cans of explosives 
attached to a wooden plank and ignited using an open wick. The Germans used stick grenades. Eventually, both sides began receiving more sophisticated weapons. The French received grenades based on the Mills internal fuse system and the Germans began using the famous stick grenade ignited by pulling a cable inside the stick handle. Trained infantrymen could throw these about 20 meters, not far enough to reach the opposing trench, so usable mainly in defense or during a surprise attack. Building dugouts and tunnels was slow, tedious work. Both sides used tools such as these picks and hammers to excavate the soft flint rock. Here the rock is flinty sandstone which is very soft rock and is perfectly preserved if kept damp. So they used picks and shovels like these tools of the time. We found them with their wooden handles and in water wood doesn't rot. So you see it was very, very tough manual labour. They could dig no more than a metre a day. Two men hacked at the flint rock, two passed back the debris and a team of six or seven passed the buckets of spoil backwards. These tunnels were very small for the simple reason that the more you dig, the more materials you have to take out. So they dig the least possible, on both sides, on the German side and on the French. An attack tunnel was on average 70 centimetres wide and one metre high. So you see you couldn't even stand up inside. Over the months, the French and German miners developed primitive systems for detecting enemy digging such as pans of water, which would make ripples with even the smallest vibration. Countermining became as important as mining. This meant digging towards the enemy tunnels and, if possible, destroying them with small explosive charges, called camouflet. The mining war became more and more sophisticated as the war dragged on. One key instrument developed to detect enemy activity was this, a form of stethoscope for listening to the earth, called a geophone. It amplified the echoes made by iron against rock and warned the tunnelers that their enemy was near. It was very important, essential. Using this listening system, at the end of the war they knew where the enemy was and what he was doing. So using these listening devices, they would take their tunnels under the enemy trench or enemy attack tunnel, then they'd lay explosive charges and blow them up and destroy them like that. This French tunnel starts in the second line trench and extends under the German front line and has several lateral listening tunnels to allow engineers to precisely locate enemy activity. There was a listening post every 50 meters. Once the location of the enemy was identified, action had to be taken. Mainly this consisted in driving a small tunnel towards the source of the sound and packing the new chamber with a small explosive charge. Each side moved slowly towards the main objective, which was to blow such a huge hole in the trenches that any attack would meet no resistance. It was a deadly game of cat and mouse. As the year of the bloodbaths of Verdun and the Somme drew to a close, the commanders on Vauquois Hill began studying some radical new solutions. They began digging deeper than ever before, in a race to the lowest part of the hill. Their goal was simply to raise all 120 meters of hill to ground level. If neither side could have it, no one would. By early 1917, two years after the French infantry had conquered the hill of Vauquois with such heavy loss of life, the commanders began the deepest mines of the whole campaign. 
This diagonal shaft is one of three that went 40 metres into the earth. The French were planning to place 140 tonnes of explosive in their deepest mines and simply blow the whole hill to pieces. The Germans too were digging in the relative safety of their concrete bunkers. Their plan was to go even deeper. Three 100-metre shafts began inching their way to the bowels of the earth. Adolf, Andy and Julia have reached the lowest part of the maze of tunnels where the Germans planned their most ambitious explosion yet. In, in summer 19, uh, 1917, the first P-30, that means the first company of the pioneer battalion 30, they uh, had the plan to, yeah, to, to blow up the full hill. And they started to dig three fighting tunnels, three, three tunnels uh -huh. down to a level of 98, uh, 9900 meters. And uh, they calculated a charge which was uh, 280,000 tons per gallery. That means Why? 840 tons, yeah. 840 tons for all the three one. They uh, applied, they, they, they had to apply for the ammunition, for, uh -huh. for the explosive, for the explosive, and somebody said, eh? what do you need? 140 tons of explosive? Yeah, uh, look, we want, would like to, to make an offensive in, in, in spring uh, 18, we need all what we have. And you, with your mine of mine warfare, uh, bring it to an end. Stop it with this bloody thing. <laughs> and uh, you, you pioneer, your company, you will uh, uh, leave this sector as, as quick as possible and go to, to the western part, to the western All front. Right. Okay. So this was more or less uh, the, the hint or the, yeah, the, the end of the, of the, 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 the work duration of the P-30 because in April they had to move. Maybe because of that, but it didn't get the explosion explosive, uh -huh. so it, uh, it were never blown up. Okay. The gallery uh, were not uh, feeding through the, the French line. It were uh, dug like that, right. and it turned, and it turned again. Okay. And it was more or less in their own position. They wanted to blow up their own position. Uh, but at least that way they knew it wasn't going to be countermined. And even the French had in mind such a, such an explosion with three three mines already in March, and but it was only a project; it was never realized. But right. the German they uh, finalized the uh, hundreds <laughs> at least. As the diggers carved through the rock, life on the surface was equally harsh. Was natürlich. The worst thing for the infantry was sitting in a position and knowing that at any time it could be blown into the air. Dead bodies often remained exposed for days, stuck in the mud or barbed wire and rotted in front of their comrades in arms. They also attracted rats that came to infest the trenches and dugouts where men tried to find some rest between skirmishes. This is a andere psychischer Moment, während wenn du eingesperrt bist in der Angst. From a psychological standpoint, it is different knowing that you are closed in a small tunnel where you can barely move. You can't go back. You want to turn back, but you are cut off because an underground mine has exploded, so you're trapped. You can only think to yourself how you are going to die, because of gas, or by running out of oxygen, or of thirst, or by drowning because water comes up. Also diese, die Möglichkeit zu sterben war so vielfältig. The French and Germans continued exploding mines at a regular pace, although both sides knew that neither had the manpower to capture the other side of the hill. Now mine shafts collapsed not only because of camouflage, but simply the fragile structure of the rock. Er wusste ja auch, welche Gefahren drohten, auch selbst wenn man nicht durch eine Sprengung ums, ums Leben kam. As soon as you got into a tunnel, there was the possibility that after an explosion there might be gas in the tunnel where you were working, leading to carbon monoxide poisoning. And at that point, you're done for. Dead. By 1917, the commanders on the surface had come to a gentleman's agreement. There would be no explosions after 7 a.m. 
and mortars and grenades would be launched only after 5 p.m. In one friendly incident at Christmas 1916, German and French miners sang to each other through the rock partition between them. It was always very sad when you lost a colleague or a comrade, such as Paul Rader, who was one of his very best friends, who was killed by gas in a tunnel. Hermann Hoppe suffered a lot. By mid-1917, the French realized that they would never have the manpower to dig so deep. A mutiny in the French army had drastically reduced its fighting effectiveness, and by then, the strategic importance of Vauquois had disappeared. After what we saw today, what we discovered, we can just imagine the waste of men the murderous folly of the fighting men, both German and French, and others. It was an incredible carnage. We've been told that there are still thousands of men buried under the hill of Vauquois. The Germans continued digging until March 1918 when they too abandoned their plan to totally destroy the hill. More important battles were being waged elsewhere. The hill of Vauquois was part of a wider front in the Argonne forest. Adolf Buchner and members of the Argonne Navalt Association have explored the tunnels built by French and Germans alike. Tunnel warfare here became just one more way of attacking the enemy when frontal assaults proved suicidal. The complexity and efficiency of the German underground campaigns were second to none. By the end of 1917, as the German and Austrian empires benefited from peace with Russia, their commanders planned a breakthrough in the West. The German April 1918 offensive on the Western Front nearly reached Paris once again. Italian troops sent to replace the French at Vauquois were ordered to blow up the entrances to the tunnels and retreat. By the end of April, it was clear the offensive had failed. And now that the United States had entered the war, the fate of Germany and Austria was sealed. Between June and September 1918, a million American troops landed on French soil and were ready to attack the weakened German lines. A renewed artillery barrage against the hill of Vauquois was the prelude to a massive American attack. Thousands of young Americans died on the hill as the hardened Imperial Guard garrison fought off the assault. It was yet another pointless bloodbath. The men who survived Vauquois had endured the horrors of modern warfare. Trapped between the firepower of terrifying new weapons above ground and massive mines in the earth below. It is thanks to their letters, diaries, photographs and the memories handed down to the younger generations that today the whole horrific story of the great underground war can finally be told. <laughs>